self-diagnosing themselves autistic. No doctor. Not one medical professional. What is the problem with people diagnosing themselves with autism online? I personally understand why people do this, and I don't think that there's a big issue. But what I will say is that if you are able to get a legitimate diagnosis or a legitimate assessment by a healthcare provider, you should do that. I've looked online and I'm aware that it's very expensive to get an assessment. And a lot of people don't have the resources or the information to go uh, and pursue a legitimate diagnosis. So in the interim, if you identify with autism or ADHD or any condition that you believe that you have, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I do have to say, if there's ever a moment in your life where you're able to go and just verify this diagnosis with a legitimate professional, I would go and do that. Now look, there are many signs that you may be a woman living with undiagnosed autism, but at the end of that stitch, the lady said that if you've ever been diagnosed with any of these conditions, that could be a sign. And there is some truth to it. A lot of times as clinicians, we forget to think about the neurodivergent conditions when you're, we're diagnosing somebody. So, you know, people will be misdiagnosed uh, with things like, you know, mood disorders like bipolar or depression, um, personality disorders like BPD, uh, anxiety, when the whole time the issue is autism or some other type of neurodivergence. So I think when you have a long list of diagnoses and you feel like you're not getting better and you feel like you identify with another condition, it could be a sign that you should be checked out for autism. Growing up neurodivergent can be very traumatic, especially when you're undiagnosed, because now we don't have an explanation for why we do the things that we do and why we are the way that we are. So I tell people all the time, if you're neurodivergent, whether it's ADHD, autism, whatever the case may be, the way that you communicate with the world is different from how other people communicate with the world. So it can be hard for you to fit in socially. That's why you have to mask a lot of times. And it can be hard for you to understand whether people are laughing with you or they're laughing at you. Uh, and it's hard to know if somebody's dating you because they like you or they want to pull something from you. And uh, I think it's it's one thing to struggle, you know, in grade school with this, but it's a whole different type of pain when you're an adult and you realize that you keep dating the same type of person over and over, but they have different faces. Hey, did you know where- Bro, just shut up! What do you want from me? Have a good one. Die! Everybody! If you're never that virgin and you're watching this video, you probably can relate to times in your life where you've been nice to people, you've spoken up, you've tried to do the right thing, and you are punished for it. And I mean, you can say it's about most people, but neurodivergent individuals do struggle to put up boundaries, they have a hard time speaking them for themselves, and you often feel bad asking for things that you probably should have had anyway. You know, just asking for basic respect and you know decency from people. So a lot of times when you decide to do the right thing, which is being kind, people will take your kindness for weakness and they'll play you. They'll, life can be very difficult when you don't know how to set boundaries. So my point is, if you're neurodivergent, understand that let's still be kind, let's still be respectful to people, but learning how to set boundaries is an essential life skill. How come neurodivergent individuals struggle to make eye contact when they're talking, but when you're hyper fixated on something, it's just easy for you to sit there and just gaze into a certain thing or into somebody's eyes? I don't know exactly why, but here, here's my theory. So with neurodivergent individuals, especially individuals on the spectrum, it can be difficult to make and maintain eye contact. Uh, and also with ADHD too. So, you know, if you are talking to somebody, you might get they're a bit nervous. You might be a little shy uh, and you may have a hard time making eye contact. So when you're talking, you're kind of looking you know, elsewhere and you're focusing on articulating yourself and getting your words out, but you're not making eye contact. Now, when you're hyper fixated on something, you're completely all into that thing. And with people who have ADHD, this is where you don't seem to struggle with anything at all.
Okay, so one of my favorite things about being neurodivergent is the fact that my thoughts make no sense. But other neurodivergent people get yeah. it. They understand. I posted a video about autism a couple of weeks ago where I was explaining that all autism is is a different way of communicating with the world. So an autistic person, the way they communicate with the world is different from how a neurotypical person will communicate. So that's where a lot of the irritability comes from. That's where a lot of the meltdowns come from, the frustration, the mood swings. So you have to understand that when you're neurodivergent, not just autism, but ADHD, dyslexia, so on and so forth, the way you go about things is different from how a neurotypical person will go about things. So there is neurodivergent humor. There are neurodivergent things that a neurotypical person would never understand. And depending on the environment that you're in, you might feel like you're weird or you're an outcast, but no need to beat up yourself. It's more important for you to find your people. And when you're around those people, you'll feel more like yourself than you've ever been. Substance use is through the roof in the neurodivergent community. And one of the main reasons why is because we struggle with self-regulation. We have a hard time managing our emotions. We have a hard time managing our mood. And whenever we're going through something, the tendency that we will rely on a substance to help us get through that thing is very high. And if you have to ask yourself why, you don't have to look too far to see the answers. When you struggle with managing your mood and you know regulating yourself, and there's something that can come and help bring you to the present, and you can wipe out whatever you're going through in that current moment, you'll probably take that out, if you'll call it that, every single time. But then when you realize that on the back end, you have to deal with brain fog, memory issues, dissociation, and so many more things that can come from chronic prolonged use of a substance, then you realize how difficult it can be to live this life. Is preferring small spoons to big spoons a sign that you have autism or some other neurodivergence? Mm, not really, but maybe potentially. Let's talk about it. So let's take autism, for example. I spent six months working with autistic kids, and I'll eat lunch with them on most days. A lot of them had preferences for how their food should be delivered to them. Like they like for the food to be cut up a certain way. And I realized that it was a sensory preference for their food to be brought to them in a certain manner, for them to use a certain type of spoon or a fork. And when it comes to the big spoon versus the little spoon thing, I do think that bigger spoons are, you know, a bit heavier, so you know, it feels like you're you know, heavy handed. And the small spoon is more compact. You might be able to prepare your food in a certain type of way. So preferring small spoons and big spoons doesn't mean you have autism, but I do think it's a sensory preference. Discovering that I am autistic has saved my life. Before I had an understanding of the way that my brain worked, I always thought that there was something wrong with me that needed to. If you are somebody who's been diagnosed later in life with autism, ADHD, or some type of neurodivergence, I need you to hear me on this one. Number one, I need you to be very kind to yourself because what happens next is a frustrating part. As you understand your diagnosis and realize that a diagnosis is just an explanation for the behaviors that you exhibit, you start to have some frustration because as you come closer to yourself and as you unmask, you realize that you've been going through all these things for years and that you were the last person to figure out that you were a little bit different and you couldn't quite point out and figure out what was going on. But just understand that nothing is ever wrong with you. Nothing was ever wrong with you. Just the way that you communicate with the world is a little bit different. And as you come close to yourself, I need you to really be nice to the person that you are. All versions, past, present, and future. One of the most helpful things that you can do for yourself as somebody who has ADHD is learning how to be kind to yourself. You've got to understand that when you have ADHD, it takes you longer to, first of all, complete each task. And then in between all the tasks that you have, there's a delay, right? There's a delay, you know, like let's say you have to do the dishes, right? You do the dishes and after that you have to go mow the lawn. For a neurotypical person, it may not take you as long to go from the dishes to the lawn, but as somebody who has ADHD, the time in between tasks is lengthened. So this, this means that there's a higher chance that you can get distracted by something else and you may not even get to go do the, the grass because after the dishes, you got distracted and then by the end of the day, you know what time blindness, you're behind on everything and you wanna beat yourself up. So learning how to be kind to yourself with ADHD is a necessary life skill. Don't forget that.